All right. So we're going to do kind of, so today is, it's like three, two, uh, which is way too, I just realized that today with the other class, I'm like, I can't believe it's already March. Like that blows my mind. I mean, I'm happy 2020 is gone, but 2021 is starting to fly through way too fast here. I'm just saying. So we're going to talk about the midterm skills portion of your practical. And if there are any questions on the actual written part, I can also answer some questions on that as well, but we'll just start with the skills portion for now. So how this is going to work, both your midterm and then also kind of your final practical is, while you guys are doing the written portion, I'm gonna come in and grab each of you. So I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna grab one of you. I will put up a sign up sheet before the practical so that if you wanna go right off the bat and get your skills portion done, you can sign up first. So it'll become a kind of a first come. If you want to go up early, great, you'll go early. But you know, as we get further down, if I don't have people signed up to go, I'm just going to start coming in and grabbing people I didn't get yet. So you know, sign up, just get it out of the way. It's kind of what I'm saying. So you know, while you're in practical, I'll come in. I'll say, okay, Joe, you're up. Come with me. And you'll come in. You'll come in. You'll draw a card because I have all of these printed on cards. And that card will give you a scenario like we're seeing here. And then you're going to introduce yourself to me. And then you're going to do whatever the card says to do on me. And then after you complete your skills portion, I may ask you a question or two through it because I'm allowed to ask you questions. And then I usually ask you one follow-up. Like if it's blood pressure, I may ask you, is the blood pressure normal or abnormal? Or what would be an abnormal blood pressure? That type of, those type of follow-up questions. We'll go through each of those we go through. And it's basically 10 points. On average, I looked, I went back through since cohort four to cohort 11, which is the group for you guys. The average score on the midterm practical is 9.8 out of 10. So it's an easy 10 points, right? So it's not gonna, don't totally freak out about it. This isn't where I'm gonna try to nail you guys on stuff. This is more, do you basically have an idea of how to do these? So what is it going to look like? What would it physically look like coming in? You're going to come in and you're going to draw your card, get everything. You're going to turn to me and say, you know, hi, Mr. McKeever. I'm Mr. McKeever. I'm going to be your physical therapist assistant student for the day. And the PT has asked me to check your Achilles tendon reflex. Is it okay that I do that? Because we want to get consent for everything we do. Sure. Okay. Can you please take off your shoes for me? Right. We're going to just go through the Achilles tendon one here because that's an easy one to example. So you're going to have me take my shoes off. Right. You're going to preferably put me up on something where my feet are kind of elevated. Right. Or that you can get to the back of my ankle. If you can't do that, you can actually raise, put somebody's foot up on your thigh area and kind of tap the tendon from behind. And then for the Achilles tendon, remember, you're going to put your palm kind of on the bottom of their foot and dorsiflex them slightly. And then you're going to take that reflex hammer, you're going to go back to the back of the Achilles tendon, you're going to give it a tap. And you're looking for the foot to go, right, down like that. And then I'm going to say, okay, so how would you grade that reflex? Well, it was normal. It was hyperreflexes, it was hyporeflexive, if it is. I'm pretty much guaranteeing most of my reflexes, if you draw them, are going to be pretty normal, except for maybe my left arm. And then I would say something like, what would be an abnormal reaction? So what would be an abnormal reaction with reflexes? Give me an example of what would be abnormal. Uh, late response. Late in response. Good, right? You tap it, nothing happens, then all of a sudden, five seconds later, boom, it goes down. That's a little weird, right? Maybe you get a response on one side, but you don't get a response on the other. That would be an abnormal. Or you get clonus. And I don't know if he talked about clonus yet. But clonus is where instead of just getting one reaction, it kind of flaps, right? And this can happen in any of the D10 reflexes. You can do it at the knee and it kicks out and, 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 and it just kind of kicks out for a little while until it kind of calms down. That's an issue with the spinal cord and stuff like that. So those would be kind of some abnormal reactions. I'm not going to specifically ask you to grade. I'm not going to say what grade is this. I'm not going to say I'm looking for is it normal? Is it hypo or is it hyper reflexive? Those are the three main comments I'm looking for for the reflexes, right? Hypo reflexive would be one where you tap it and there's barely any response. But could hypo reflexive be normal for the patient? 
Yes. Yeah, right? If both sides are the same, it's just the patient. As long as they don't have any type of, you know, problems with it. Like if I'm hypo-reflexive in my patellar tendon reflex, but I also have problems extending my knee, now that could lead me down the path of, well, there might be a problem, right? But if I'm normal, I can walk around, I'm just hypo-reflexive or I'm hyper-reflexive. Maybe it, you do it and I smack myself in the face with the bicep tendon reflex. That can be normal too. So that's kind of the Achilles tendon one, right? There's a lot of wording in here. It's just to make it kind of scenario-like. So let's look at the next one. You're treating a patient with spinal cord injury who's been on caseload for several weeks, showing improvement. Test the patellar tendon reflex. So same idea here. You're gonna come in and introduce stuff, do all that normal stuff. You're gonna position me that my legs are not touching the ground, right? Because you have to be able to kick up. And I'll, I'll move one of the mats into the office so that we can actually do this. You'll take out a reflex hammer. You'll bang me right on that patellar tendon. My foot should kick up. I'm not gonna do anything mean to you guys. Um, well, I gotta find out what Dr. Johnson, I gotta find out what we can do. That's the problem. I don't know. I think we can do partners. I'm not sure yet, Brooks. That's a, one of the things I have to find out from him. If I can do partners, then I'll probably just do, bring you as partners back then. That would make my life a lot easier so I don't get smacked 20 times. Um, just saying, make my life a little bit easier. But I'm just I'm planning right now for me, and if it changes, then we can bring a partner back. <laughs> I'm getting ready to be smacked with a reflex hammer several times in that day, is what I'm saying. Right? So you're going to find my teller tendon, right? What I'm looking for when you're doing this, I'm looking for, are you palpating? Are you kind of finding, taking your fingers and finding where that tendon is so that you can go and whack it with the reflex hammer? Teller tendon one's one of the ones that most people should respond to, right? That's a pretty easy one. So again, next one, we're looking at the Babinski reflex. Do you guys remember how to do this one? Where are we testing this one? Heel to toe. Heel to toe, right? Going along that outer edge, kind of like making a out, kind of a C almost like, right? And you're looking, does, do I tickle? <laughs> or does your partner tickle? Or do you get an abnormal kickback of the toes and do they flay? So for this one, would you want the socks off? Yes. Yeah, right? For the Achilles tendon, doesn't matter if you take the socks off. Right. But if you're doing the Babinski, you want to have the socks off because you need to be able to see if the toes move. Right. When Dr. Johnson did it with me and I had socks on, you really didn't get to see my toes kind of flare out because I had compression socks on. Right. So that's one of the things you want to kind of take off and go, okay. And hopefully your partner um, will have washed their feet. I definitely will have taken a shower that day so you don't get sticky feet. No, I'm just kidding. I promise it'll go easy. We only had one person that like drew the Babinski reflex and was like, oh my God, that's bad. Please wash your socks that day. Yeah, I thought, come on. I, I, somebody caught up on it. I was trying to make it funny. So that's Babinski, biceps tendon reflex. This is probably the one that most people hate because for whatever reason, it just freaks them out because they have to smack their thumb a little bit. I don't want to think, I don't want, oh. right? Give it a good whack. Your, your thumb's going to be okay. I promise you. We've all closed our fingers indoors at some point in our life. Your finger will survive that, right? So you're going to come in, introduce stuff, do the same thing. You're going to come down here and palpate for my, I'm looking for you. Can you find my bicep tendon? There's my bicep tendon. I'm going to lay my finger on it, thunk, and I should get a little bit of elbow flexion, right? That's how, this is literally how easy the reflex parts are. Brachioradialis, right? Where am I going to strike with brachioradialis? Forearm? Yeah, right. Forearm just proximal to the radial styloid process. And Dr. Johnson and I have a little different technique for this. He strikes a little bit lower. I tend to come up a little bit more in the arm when I'm doing it. It doesn't matter. It's the difference between Dunkin' Donuts and Maple Donuts. They're basically donuts. As long as you get that kind of thing. Now, what are we looking for? We're either looking for a little bit of elbow flexion because brachioradialis does a little bit of assistive elbow flexion, right? Or kind of this going on in the thumb, right? You get some thumb reaction going on. 
that's why with those, a lot of those, I like to palpate. I like to get one hand on that brachial radialis when I'm tapping it so I can feel if I get a contraction in there. Because sometimes it's a little harder to see with the thumb kind of twitching or the hand kind of twitching. But I can definitely get my hand on that, that brachial radialis and go, ooh, there's a nice little twitch. Mr. McKeever? Yes. Um, when we're doing our, uh, like this portion of the test and say we do get one of these that are a little bit more harder to like find like right on the first try, do we have to find it on the first try in order for us to be like graded from that or? No, I'm, look, I'm looking more, again, just like blood pressure, this is more skills wise. Okay. Right? Yes. Now, I'm hoping you get it after you smack the partner about 10 times. If you keep beating <laughs> on them, I might say something, okay, let's work on it. And I am able to cue you in these. Okay. So if, you know, you you draw the bicep. So when would you lose points would be a good question on that, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you draw a brachial radialis reflex and you're testing the biceps. I'm going to give you a little bit to catch on. You're going the wrong way, mm -hmm. right? I'll give you, in the, old, in the old terms, we call it, give you a little bit of rope to hang yourself with there a little, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to go ahead and test the biceps and I'm going to be like, are you sure that's the bice, the brachioradialis reflex? If I say something like that, that might be a loss of one point. Really, okay. that, that's what most, I've had it where people freak out. And the big one I've had for, for is some of you will draw the Achilles tendon reflex and do the patellar tendon reflex. Just okay. because they're so freaked out that <laughs> they see the patient's knee and that's what they look at. And then I just cue you, you lose one point, you get nine out of 10, it's not a big deal. But I'm looking more, if you draw it, are you doing the right one? Okay. Right. And if you don't get perfect, yeah, I'm not really that concerned. Okay. Thank you. Good. Good question. So we've had Achilles, we had patellar tendon, we had Babinski, biceps, brachioradialis. Those, oh, and then triceps tendon, right? That's the one you're going to have them hanging out. And they're going to do that. I forget what that dance move is, but there's, there's a dance part of the robot, I think, or something. I don't know. They're going to kick out to the side and extend the elbow, right? Because that's what the tricep does. And now not part of your practical, but also kind of tying to, to your, um, to anatomy and also your learning. Could you also trace these back to a nerve root later on? Not now. You don't have to do it for a question. But could we actually test these reflexes and determine if they have a spinal cord injury at a specific place by these reflexes? Yeah. Yeah. That's why we're learning them. Right. If I do the triceps, re if I do biceps and I do brachioradialis and you have normal reactions, but I do triceps and there's nothing that can hint to me that you have a lower cervical injury. So, yeah, that's why we're doing this. That's kind of the reason behind it. So triceps tendon. So now we come down here and we're going to do some dermatome testing. So dermatome testing. Let's go over the basics of it, and then I'll go over, go kind of through them here as we go down. So the basics of it, you're going to come in and introduce yourself, right? Tell them what you're going to do. If you say dermatome testing to a patient, they're going to be like, you want me to read a book, a dermatome? They don't know what you're talking about, right? I'm going to test your sensation in a couple areas. Is it okay that I do that? Right? And what that's going to look like is I'm going to touch you in a certain area and I'm going to touch you on the other side. And I want you to tell me if they feel the same or if something feels different. That's a good explanation. There's one way of saying it. you could just as well say, I'm going to touch you on your upper arm and the other upper arm. Let me know if something feels different or let me know if it feels the same. You don't have to be tricky with this. You don't have to do anything fancy. Right. When Mr. McKeever does this, I play tricks with my patient. I'll be like, Okay, so I'm going to touch the side of your head. Close your eyes for me. Do you feel that? And the patient's like, no. Well, that's good because I didn't touch you. Because I want to see if they're paying attention to what I'm asking them anyway. Right? But for you guys, you don't have to, be, you don't have to do anything that fancy. Right? You're just going to do it. So let's look at the first one we got here. So your patient's on caseload, and you're asked to perform light dermatomal testing for C3, C4. If you had to do that on me, where would you test that on me? Like kind of behind your ear a little for C3? Great. 
So starting somewhere that start right behind the ear kind of starts C2, but as long as you start there and kind of come down across the upper trap, that would be testing C3, C4. Yes. Right. So kind of doing one of these numbers. So I'm going to come and I'm going to go, does this feel the same as this? The neck and the collarbone. Good. Yep. Now, if you test, if you're just come up here, I might ask you, is that going to test C4 as well? Oh no. Okay. Do a full kind of stroke. I'm not going to take points off for that. That's not a points one. That's more of a clarification, kind of giving you cueing to fix it, if that makes sense. But let's say it's set, if I said C3 and you're like, how does this feel? And I'm like, that's not C3 or 4, right? I, I, my answer to that, if you did that, would be, is that the most appropriate area to test C3, C4? If you hear me say that, what should you probably be thinking? So kind of test both? Yeah, or either I need to test both or I tested the wrong area. Yeah, you're gonna have the patient close their eyes, right? So you're gonna come up to me and say, Mr. McKeever, I need you to close your eyes for me. And I'm gonna be freaking out because I'm not gonna know what you're doing to me. And you, one of you may poke me in the eye or something, I don't know. And you're gonna come up to my shoulder. I'm like, okay, does this feel the same as this? I could say, yeah. Or you could ask, where am I touching you at? Is this a deep or a shallow sensation? Any of those are valid, right? You're learning some of those in modalities, right? Does this feel the same as this? It's probably the easiest one to get through your head. So don't, you don't have to get fancy, but that's an easy way. So I come up, does this feel the same as this? Yes. Okay. So then that begs the question, I'm going to have that follow-up question. What would be a abnormal or a weird response for a dermatome test? What do you yeah, think could be on one yeah. side? Yeah, I only feel on one side. Good, right? For me, once you get past my about here on my deltoid, that's what's going to happen, right? What else? Pain. Yeah, you're like, does this? And I'm like, yeah. What did you just do to me? Right. That's an abnormal response. A withdrawal response. Right, because it hurts, uh, like a hyperalgesic moment type idea, and that's terms you'll learn down the road, or an allodynia type moment, where it's like, I'm like, oh, that really hurts. What are you doing to me? And I'm like, I'm literally just touching you. That's weird. That's weird. That makes sense, though. So those are answers. Or you know, like I said, one side you feel it, one side you don't, or both sides you don't feel it. That would be an abnormal response too. Right? Or you ask the patient, where am I touching you at? And you say, uh, the patient's like, my kneecap. Okay. Got some issues going on there. And I've had that before when they have different types of sensation issues where you'll ask them, where am I touching you? And they'll say, my right hand. Well, number one, I test on the left side. And number two, I'm definitely not on their hand. That would be an abnormal response. So that's C3, C4. Mr. McKeever, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, what did you how, did, how did you say we could say dermatomes when two Just patients, gonna, like I'm another gonna some, I'm going to do some light touch testing on you. Oh, light touch testing. Okay. Or I'm going to test your sensation is another way you could say it. Okay. I'm going to see if you're sensational. I'm going to test your sensation. Of course, you got me and I make jokes about everything I do with patients. So I may say something like that. I'm going to see how sensational you are today. I'm going to test your sensation. Okay, thank you. I like to have fun when I'm working with my patients. I probably get away with more than I ever should. I'm going to be 100% honest, guys. I'm surprised I haven't gotten like socked in the head with something yet. All right, so now you got a patient that's on caseload, and they have a dermatome problem at C7, C8. So now where am I going to start at? Your middle finger and your pinky, I believe. Yeah, so I'm going to come. So I'm just going to take and go down kind of middle finger and the outside of my hand, right? Does this feel the same as this? Yeah, okay, great. And again, make sure I close my eyes for dermatomes. When we get to myotomes at the end of the semester, you're not going to have, they don't have to close their eyes for muscle movement, but for touch, they do. Because if you say, does this feel the same as this? And I've got my eyes open, I'm going to be like, sure. Right, or you're like, where am I touching you? Uh, I can see you touching my hand, right? We need to have a little bit of, 
bias. And then you'll still have the patient. I love when I work with kids and I do this because kids are like, okay, close your eyes. Are your eyes closed? Yeah, then why can I see them? Oh, right. So there is that as well. So C7, C8, down to that middle finger and then out to the pinky. Um, I could test it in the palm too. I could start at kind of the middle finger portion of my palm and come across if I wanted. That would be valid as too. That would be valid as well, right? All of that would be valid. Now, if I come up here and I'm testing out here, now I'm more five six, right? So that's where you got to be careful and make sure you're testing the right areas. Yes. For uh, C seven and eight, can you do the motion again? I couldn't quite. See. Sure. I'm sorry. Let me put my hand up here. So I can come and just come across my fingers. Okay, so you use both of your fingers just yeah. for the- you, you can know. use both fingers. You can use all your hand. Doesn't really matter. Um, you could do one finger if you wanted to. You could do, use a reflex hammer. Okay. There's, you know, if, you, if you're like, ew, this person's stinky, I don't want to touch them. You could use a reflex hammer. Okay. So it's just mainly taken. So I could take, I could even take a pen and bring it across as long as I'm doing the right area, right? Okay, and it's a cross not coming from the top of the finger down? You could, sure, you could do that. As long as when you do it, you do kind of all the fingers in that area or, oh. you know, that I see that you've got C7, which is the middle finger and you do one of the other fingers. That makes sense? Because yes. just coming down C7 doesn't get C8. You've got to come out here and get C8 as well. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, no problem. These are not questions to be held back. Ask the questions, that's what I'm here for. All right, this is the one that nobody wants to draw. For whatever reason, this is the one that people always kind of freak out about. You're testing T8 to T10. Where do you test this at? The inferior angle of the scapula. Okay, good. Yeah, you could do on the back. I think. You theoretically could mm -hmm. do it on the back, good, right? And you're going to come down mm -hmm. kind of the inside of the spine. The easier way is to sell, tell your patient, hey, can you point to your belly button for me? They point to their belly button, and then you do either side of the belly button just kind of in a vertical line. Does that make sense? Because if, if you look on your dermatome map, T8 is right above the belly button, T9 is kind of right at belly button, T10 is just below the belly button. That's why most people don't want to do this because they don't want to touch people's belly buttons. I thought, I thought T9 was belly button and then T10 was below it, or, yeah, sorry. It's just, well, it's, again, so T8 kind of comes right above. So what it, we'll, we'll, I'll answer that in a second, bro, real quick. So T8 is right above belly button, T9 is kind of at belly button, and T10 is below. This is where it gets weird, because when we talk about in spinal cord, T10 really is more the belly button than T9, but we vary, right? I could test you and test your belly button, and you could be all T10, whereas Brooke may be T8, because we're a little bit different in sensation. But as long as I kind of test that whole area around the belly button, I'm hitting all three of the dermatomes. I may even hit a little T11. Right? We're not going to get down to S4, S5. That's a totally different area. Um, so the nipple one is T4. Right? I, I don't know why that one's the one I always remember. And again, like I said, when we get to spinal cord injury, we'll actually we'll test at the nipple line because it's kind of important to understand if the patient has normal kind of erection of the skin and stuff like that with spinal cord injuries. So, right? So we talked about, we've got we said C3, C4, right? And you're not going to get, so understand these are the scenarios you're drawing. If they're not in here, you're not going to draw them. I'm not going to put you on a T12 if it's not in here. Does that make sense? These are the only ones you have to worry about kind of prepping for. For real life, do you have to know all of them? Sure, absolutely. You have to know where T2 is. You have to know where, you know, you'll have to know where S4, S5 is but this isn't something we're going to test in a practical setting. Kind of, I kind of brought them down to the ones that are really important for you to know specifically for your clinical rotations. Okay, L1, L2. What do you think for L1, L2? Your hip and your upper thigh? Yep. So I usually start just right at my, um, oh my God, my, uh, Ox cox a wing out here, right? My hip bone, my big old hip bone, and I come down to the greater troke. So does that feel the same as that? I think the leg ones to me are, make more sense than most of the rest of the body. I don't know why to me. Maybe it's because I treat so many more legs than I treat the upper body. 
but the leg dermatomes just make sense to me. And I also probably because when I have spinal cord injury patients, the one thing that most times is knocked out is the legs, right? So does this feel the same as this, right? Now, am I going to, I'm not going to get particular on you here, right? Same thing with the belly button. If you don't go exactly two inches above the belly button and exactly two inches below the belly button, am I going to take points off? No, that's not going to happen, right? Or if instead of testing the belly button, you decide to come back to the like inferior of the angle of the scapula and come down to mid back, I'm not going to take points off for you. That's still a valid region. Trust me, I know the regions. I don't know if you're tricking me. Right. So if you decide, oh, I'm going to, I'd rather test the T's on the back. Okay. Do it. I'm looking to, you know, where it's at. I'm not going to then trick you up and go, where else could you test it? Blah, 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 blah. I'm more looking, what's an abnormal response? What's a normal response? Right. Suddenly you, you test, like if you drew me and you tested seven and eight, you're going to get a response over here. I'm not going to feel it over here. That's an abnormal response. Well, why is it? Because I have a spinal cord injury. It's kind of the way it is. I've learned to live with it. So we did L1, L2. What about L3, L4? What do you think for L3, L4? Like L4 is your medial calf? Medial calf is L4, good, right? So I'm gonna start about mid thigh and come down along my knee to my mid calf on the inside. All right, so I'm just gonna come down, come across the knee and go to the inside. If I go to the outside, what do I test? The lateral calf? Yeah, the lateral calf would be which, which dermatome? L5. L6, I believe? L5. L5, okay. L5, right? So L3 is kind of the meat of my thigh. Right, most of my quad is L3. And then I come down and I kind of come down and I go in to get L4, right? And that one, believe it or not, the reason I have this on here is this is probably one of the biggest ones you're gonna test because patients that have something like a ACL repair or have a problem with the femoral nerve, this is one of the areas that gets kind of numb commonly. And so when that happens, they're also going to lose what we'll talk about when we get to mitomes, they may lose some knee extension. So this helps us hone in on exactly what area is injured. So come from kind of the mid, the mid inside of the thigh all the way down to the inside of the calf. Oops, that's over here is what I want to go down. If you were just to test the medial calf, like instead of going up, to go down if we just do as long as you get like, close as long as you get close to the knee i'm okay okay like if you started at the, the big meaty part of the calf and came up to the knee you'd be fine okay because whenever you have like l3 and four we have to test both at the same time correct yeah well i mean you could okay. you could theoretically test l3 and then test l4 if you wanted okay you have to do them in one fell swoop like you go all right and and here's the deal i'll give you some clues to help that help previous students it is verbalized when you're doing it. So, okay, so up here I'm testing L3, I'm down here I'm testing L4. You don't really want to do that with a patient, but if that helps you remember it, do it. I'm not going to take points off for you talking to yourself. <laughs> Talk to yourself. That's what helped me get through a lot of my practicals in bio. And, you know, I would go through and I'd be like, okay, so there's this, there's this, there's this. Oh, that's this muscle. There, there is a certain amount of kind of cognitive recall that happens when you think to yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah. What about S1, S2? Your plantar flexion Good. and your hamstring? Yeah, you could come, yeah. So come from the bottom, the plantar surface of your foot up kind of the backside of your leg, right? Popliteal fossa is the great one. That would be the, that would be kind of the most ideal for S2. So when I do this one, usually in the field, if I'm testing S1, S2, I pinch the pinky toe and I test behind the knee. Those are my way, that's my way of doing it because I know that the pinky toe is definitely S1 and I know definitely back in that popliteal fossa, that's S2. But you theoretically could go, you could do a Vinci up to the back of the leg. 
there's not a real wrong one here. Again, you can see there's not a real wrong way to do these. It's more, are you just getting the kind of right area? The number one mistake, this is probably the one that I see the most mistake on because somebody will test the anterior surface of the big toe and that's L5. So pinky toe, bottom of the foot's your safest, I think, bottom of the foot and behind the knee. You do that, you're golden. All right, so these are the ones that everyone's the most terrified of. You shouldn't be, these are easy. Patient return to clinic for routine visit, take the patient's blood pressure and report the findings. What am I looking for here? Number one, do you put the cuff on the arm and not on their throat? That would be bad, right? So put it in the upper arm. Are you getting everything set up right where you can read it, right? I've had students before do this for me. This is, this is when Mr. McKeever kind of laughs and chuckles out loud is, I see students get everything set up and their blood pressure dial is face down on the mat. And they're like, I think the blood pressure is 121 over 90. Really? 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 You can't even see the dial. Uh, oh, yeah, you caught that. I'll catch that. I typically, you know, I know Dr. Johnson showed you clipping it on the thing. I typically like to have the patient hold it just because that way they can kind of see their blood pressure too as you're taking it. Um, and I teach them kind of what I'm doing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pump up your arm, right? So we're gonna pump it up, pump, pump, pump it up. And I'm not looking for the boards version. You can ask the patient their normal blood pressure. You can take it to 180. I'm not really picky on that. You're gonna slowly let it out. And that first sound is which part of the blood pressure? The systolic number. Systolic, good, right? And then it's gonna go, it's gonna get louder, right? You heard that when you're doing it, it's like, it goes, it comes back, whoosh. And then it's whoosh, 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 whoosh. And it's gone. And that gone point is the diastolic. Good, good job guys. See, you learned something yesterday. Now, one thing I'll say with blood pressure, remember, why can't you have an odd number on blood pressure? Um, it, it doesn't it go by two on the yeah, it goes by two on the dial. You're exactly right. Yeah, there's no, there's no way you can tell you're at 91, right? So don't say 121 over 91, just say 120 over 90, 180, 180 over 60 should always be an even number because they don't go by it. Now, if you have a mechanical machine, like I have right here, yeah, this can read. It may give 121 over 90, may give 135 over 40, right? No, note to self, you cannot bring one of these and use this to get your blood pressure comp, just let you know. So then the big question I get from you students is, well, Mr. McKeever, are you gonna use the double-headed stethoscope? No, I hate the double-headed stethoscope. I think the problem with that is sometimes me listening in makes you really nervous, right? Even me just being there doing a skills portion with you is going to make you nervous enough. There is a technique to actually measuring blood pressure by measuring radial pulse. I will use that technique. So while you're taking the person's blood pressure up here, I'll be measuring the radial pulse and getting my blood pressure that way. I will show you that technique next semester. If you get really, really good at it, like I am, I'm pretty good. I can get within most times within four of almost every person. Um, you know, if you say, oh, I got 120 over 80 and I got 122 over 84, good, you're fine. So then you're going to say, okay, Mr. McKeever, I got it. And it was 119 over 60. Then my follow-up question would be, well, where would that fall? Oh, that'd be normal. And you're going to learn that tomorrow, obviously, right? Or, oh, that would be hypertensive or that would be pre-hypertensive. And you, again, that'll come tomorrow. Don't totally freak out about that right now. Or I may ask you, what would be an abnormal finding? Oh, well, the systolic's way high. Great, that's the answer to your question. Because there's, I ask you one question that's worth one point. So you wanna make sure you kind of get that easy question out of the way. The big question I have here is, what if I don't get it on my first attempt? What if I don't get blood pressure on my first attempt? So here's the deal. I would rather have you tell me, I'm going to do it again, than lie to me. 
I will know if you're lying. Trust me, I've done this long enough, right? You're like, well, um, was that 120 over 90? Yeah, it was 120 over 90, right? I don't know if you didn't get the blood pressure. Are you gonna lose points for that? Well, if you lie to me, yeah, you're gonna lose points. But if you don't get it on the first try, no, redo it. I would rather you be accurate than sit there and pretend like you know what you're doing. And again, it's not like this is an end of the world thing where if you cannot get blood pressure, you fail the skills portion. If you put the cup on, you did it, did it, did it, and do everything. And for whatever reason, your patient is just being a royal pain in the butt and you can't get blood pressure, you might lose one point as long as you do the technique properly, right? It's better to do the technique properly and have everything right. Now, what if you can't, for whatever reason, you can't hear it on the right arm? What could you do? Switch to the left. Switch to the left arm. I am a purist, and I talked to some of you guys about this. I'm a purist when it comes to vitals. I typically only take vitals on the left side because there's a theory about the left side arteries and veins and all that return a little bit straighter to the heart, and it gives me a little bit better reading. I only take typically, unless I've got a patient that maybe has had a mastectomy on that side, and then I might not use that left arm, I might use the right arm, because sometimes that mastectomy can mess with the vitals I get on that side. But for the most part, when I take any pulse, I take it left side. When I take blood pressure, I take it left side. Um, so any of that's going, when I take pulse ox, I typically take it on the left side. And the main reason for that is two reasons. Number one, I'm a purist about it. And that's kind of the way I learned it from my, I had a guy that was a um, cardiopulmonologist that taught us anatomy and that he stressed, you only take vitals on the left side. And for some reason, Dr. Johnson, well, mine was Dr. Johnson actually too, now that I think about it, that's stuck in my head. And so I, only, I just constantly do it on the left side. The other thing is when I put the vitals down on the soap notes later on, which you guys are starting to work on in Dr. O'Neill's class, you have to indicate where you took the vitals at. And it's a lot easier for me if I just stay with the left side of taking vitals on the left side when I document it. So you wanna do right side, feel free to do right side. I just tend to do left side. It is what it is. If you do right side, I still can take the blood pressure. I'm not totally left side and dominant. But that's it for blood pressure. Then this is the one, so we got carotid pulse, we got radial pulse. Do we have any, oh, we'll talk about that in a second. So carotid and radial pulse. Techniques overall are gonna be the same. Notice something here. What do you not see on pulse? Which pulse do you not see here? Temporal. Temporal, and you don't see the one everyone's scared of, brachial. Brachial. Right. See, Mr. McKeever is nice, and so is Dr. Johnson. We're not gonna make you take the brachial pulse. You have to know how to do it, right? But we make you take the pulse at two of the easier positions. Radial, carotid. Those are both pretty easy. So what would you say? What, you'd come in and you'd say, hi, you know, Dr. Johnson, I'm going to take your pulse today at your neck. Is it okay if we do that? Great. Boom. Done. You can have a calculator if you need one. I have a calculator in my office. Yes. So Can that, we use our? Yes, you can use time. it. Can we, can we use our phones for the timer? Yes, you can use, again, for, for our anatomy purposes, you can use your phone for a timer. I will also have okay. a stopwatch in there so that if you want to use a stopwatch, you can use that. Um, but yeah, definitely, if you want to use a uh, watch, it's funny, the first, I think, cohort five had the communal watch. It was this, and I joke about being a Pikachu watch. They did have a Pikachu watch that they just passed on and off as people came out of the room. <laughs> They're like, here, here, go, go take, uh, go take pulse, right? So carotid, right? You're going to come up here. You're going to come right kind of in this region here. I kind of think of myself, here's my SCM, right? Coming right into that SCM area, get my carotid pulse. Oh, my AFib is bad today. That's all over the place. Now, like me, with a patient like me, if you can't get a good 15 second measurement, you may have to go for 60 seconds. But again, it's only 60 seconds. It's not the end of the world. Right? You can do for this class, you can do 15 seconds and multiply it times four. You could do 30 seconds and multiply it times two. I tend to do 30 times two just because it makes math easier in my head. But if you want to do 15 times four, do 15 times four. I'm not going to blast you either way you do it. 
I will not let you do, I had some students like, well, can I do 10 seconds and multiply it by six? No, now I'm drawing the line there. So carotid, right? Radial, I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna give you a little secret about the radial pulse. If you're having ever trouble finding the radial pulse, have the patient kind of radially deviate the hand a little bit. Because what that does is that kind of sinks that, that little, it almost creates like a little fossa there and you can kind of get in on the artery a little bit better. But in any of these, if you can't find a carotid pulse, I really can't help you there. That's a pretty easy one to find, just being honest, right? But in any of these, if you're in a clinic and you can't find the pulse, right? You change locations and locate the pulse. If I can't get it in my radial area, I'm gonna move up to brachial. If I can't get brachial, I'm gonna move up to carotid. Most of the times for myself, because I've worked in acute care settings, if I'm having problems with the distal pulse, I'm gonna to go to apical pulse, which we didn't even talk about, where I'm gonna to listen to the heart, right? So don't totally freak out. And which arm do you pick? I don't care. I don't care if you chest, right, pulse. One thing I'll say is typically, and somebody asked me about this yesterday is, do you ever cross the body? I typically don't with the carotid, right? If I'm testing on this, this side over here, my hand's gonna be coming from that side. And that's only because it just, I think when you cross over and kind of get that crossover going, it looks like you're choking the patient and they might freak out a little bit. Don't choke your patient. This is not how you check carotid pulse, just to let you know. This is how you rip out somebody's windpipe. Don't rip out windpipes. So that's it for pulse. And then the last thing you guys have are the cranial nerves. So the first card you have here is your supervising therapist asks you to test the patient's cranial nerves five, or sorry, two, three, four, and six. What are those nerves? Those are all the, the nerves of the what? The eye? The eye. Good. So what I'm looking for is, do you take out a pen light, right? So what are some of the things you're going to have me do? The letter H. Yep. Follow. Okay. I want you to follow this with your eyes and only your eyes. There's my letter H. I've checked one of them, right? There's one. I've got, oh, actually, I checked most of them there, right? That's most of my mobile ones. And then what else are you going to do? I chart. Yeah, I chart. Tell me what the letter is on the third row. Oh, that's a C. Okay, great. Or tell me, read the letter, read the third row, right? Because you only have to go down to that that line that like is really super easy. <clears throat> now, I'll say this once. I had this once in a clinic. If your patient doesn't speak English, that can be one that can be challenging. <laughs> I had a clinician like, can you read the third line to me? And the, the patient's like standing there. He's like, I don't think he, I don't think he knows what I'm asking. I'm like, that's because he speaks Croatian. Oh, that can be a problem, right? So you're gonna do eye chart, and then the last thing you're gonna do is turn your light on and do what? Watch for pupil pupil dilation, right? I watch for pupil dilation when you guys come into the test because pupil dilation is a sign of fear, right? So I watch you guys come in. Your eyes are like this. You're in headlights. So, are you going to have a question regarding these cranial nerves at the end of the okay. testing? Yep. So once you test it, what I'll say is, what would be an abnormal finding? So you could say, well, the pupils don't dilate, or I'm doing the H test, and what what might I do that would be abnormal? Right? I follow the eyes didn't follow at all, right? Or I follow with my head. That's going to be more if I have, you know, ETOH or alcohol in my system, right? We've all seen cops or um, live PD where they do that sobriety test. So you say, follow the pen. And the person's like, and they're and then it's like, no, don't move your head. Okay. Right? That's a problem with possibly comprehension as well but just follow it, dun, 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 right? Uh, other thing that could be abnormal is when you take me back to the eye chart and I can't see the line. Like if you have me right now, close my left eye, I'm trying to see, 
I can make out LOL because I know what that is, but the rest of the stuff on my screen looks like mush. I can't see it with my left eye because I have optic nerve damage from when I was younger, right? I'm almost this left eye. I saw some of you guys are just about as blind as me. I'm 2200 in that left eye. I'm just basically blind or 2100 with correction, but 2200 without basically blind in that left eye. One of these days I'm getting a real old. My right eye is going to get bad. So am, am I doing both eyes or just one on the reading one? Well, you you can do so. Here's the thing: is with that one, I'm just looking. So with optic, I typically don't test both like sides separate. You can. I'm not going to take points off if you don't. If that makes sense, because I'm going to be honest in my clinical, I don't take points off. Or when I'm in when I'm working with patients, I'm more concerned: can their eyes actually see the chart and interpret it, even with both eyes? I, like I thought about that, and I talked to Dr. Johnson about it, like, you know, I don't think I've ever tested a single eye on an eye chart unless I was doing eye therapy, which there is a form of physical therapy that does eye therapy. And then, yeah, maybe, but for the most part, no. I mean, you can cover your right eye, cover you, you can do both. Yeah, absolutely. There's not a wrong way to do it here. What would be wrong? What could go wrong here? You test the H, you test the I chart, and you miss the um, pupil dilation. There we go. My brain wasn't working for a second. I think I had a mini stroke there. Um, you don't test pupil dilation, right? Or you test pupil dilation, you test the I chart, and you forget to do the H. So what's going to happen at that point? I'm going to say, did you forget to do anything? If you hear that, that means, what should you think? I forgot to do something. Right. And then just, oh, yeah, I got to do the H. Okay. You do the H. I'm not going to take points off. If I have to go, how about testing ocular tracking? And then you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Let me do that. Now I might take a point off for you. If I have to like spell it out for you, that's when you'll lose a point. If I say, did you forget to do anything and you do it, I'm not going to take a point off. I'm going to try to give you 10 points is what I'm kind of, you see, I'm trying to give you 10 points. If you know your name, you get a point. Hopefully, <laughs> if you know your name, here's the deal. If you come in and introduce yourself, know your name and get consent, you've already got three out of your 10 points. You're well along the way. All right, so now we're going, treating a patient with a spinal cord injury who's been on caseload for several weeks and is showing improvement. You're testing cranial nerves five and cranial nerve seven. Oops, why did I do that? That just, there you go. What's five and seven? Oh, once one takes the, okay. Trigeminal. Trigeminal. And what else? Facial. Facial. Good. So trigeminal, do you remember what you have the patient do? Clinch your jaw, right? And then facial, what do you have them do? Um, like frown and stuff. Smile, frown, right? Make the joker face, right? So I usually have them do that. I'll put my hands up here kind of on the temporalis area and I'll say, okay, what I want you to do right now is I want you to clench your jaw. All right, I want you to smile. I want you to frown. Can you furrow your brow? Right? And all throughout that, I'm keeping these fingers up here because even with testing facial nerve, you're gonna get some trigeminal reaction. So maybe when you had them clenched their jaw, you didn't quite feel anything, but they started moving around the rest of their face and now you felt that trigeminal nerve fire. Good, that's all it is. That one's probably one of the easier ones. So clench jaw, smile, frown. Clench jaw, furrow brow, smile would be fine as well. I'm not making you do all of them. I'm looking to test most of them. What would be an abnormal response here? Not being able to frown or smile. Yeah, not being, yeah, you tell them this frowning, you're like, I am, um, I'm just a happy person, right? Or you tell them to smile and suddenly this side goes up, but this side just stays down, right? And they get this yeah, I, was, I was watching, my girlfriend had to do modules for her nursing and there was like all a bunch of stroke victims they were doing these tests on. Yep, exactly. And we're actually, this is part of the FAST testing that we do for strokes, F-A-S-T, base arm speech time. 
right? And that's probably what she was watching was how to test to see if patients having a stroke, right? Yeah. So they're just testing the facial nerve. And why would we test the cranial nerve if they're having a stroke? Well, that's going to be one of the nerves closest to the brain, right? They're going to test a lot. Nurses have to test these too. So that's five and seven. You've been on caseload and a patient's testing cranial nerve eight. What is cranial nerve eight? It's probably my favorite. Well, it's not my favorite, but it's Dr. Johnson's favorite. My vestibular. vestibular cochlear. Good. Right? Vestibular. So how do you test this? It's got two components. With the fork? Any fork or just snapping. You can do snapping. My cranial nerve eight should be vestibular cochlear, right? Wait a minute. Oh, once, one, two. No, it is. I didn't mean to say that. I don't know what my. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, maybe you just had a you had a mini stroke like I had just a second ago. So it's okay. We'll call it that. Right. So yeah, you test the ears first, and then you could do something as simple as can you stand up from your chair for me? That would be a balance activity. You could have them stand up and put their feet together. You could have them stand in tandem stance. Could, if you wanted to be mean, you could have them stand on one leg. Right? Just some, some form of a balance test. You know, with most old people that, old people, it doesn't sound good, older people, even just standing up from a chair with, with a vestibular issue, they're going to be wobbling all over the place. So it'll tell you if there's an issue there. And we're going to use a lot of this when we get into vestibular training in neuro in a little bit. Still got about 34 minutes yet. Are Sounds we going to have to do the map of the cranial nerves in the brain like for me no are you, are you asking for the actual for dr johnson's test yeah i think for dr johns i don't know that you have to have the map uh, but you do have to understand i know the questions will be you have to label put them in order right if there's some sensory motor or both and know what they are for the test i don't think you have to label them you said that we're gonna have like that sheet we filled out in mm -hmm. lab, and it's just gonna be blank yeah, I didn't think you have to. I, now, if I was, if it was me, you'll have to label them, and we may have. You may have to do that in neuro coming up, like knowing where at least where they come out of the brain, because we're going to talk about we're going to we get to neuro. That's going to explain some of those framing you learned about in the brain, like your cribriform plate that you learned about in the brain with all those little holes. Guess what comes through that? Well, your olfactory nerve, your olfactory bulbs, your smell. Right. And we're going to learn through certain things like which frame in does the trigeminal come out, which frame in does the optic nerve come out. Optic nerve frame in is really easy. It's the optic canal. Just going to give you a hint there. But that's later down the line. I think you just have that blank sheet that's like got the, all the Roman numerals. You've got to put them all in order. And then you've got to put if they're sensory motor or both. Right. Some say money matters. Go through that type of an idea. And then define them. Smell, sight, track size that type thing for the written portion. So that's cranial nerve eight. Cranial nerve nine, 10, and 12. You'll notice they're grouped together. Well, why are they grouped together? Because they all kind of go together. They're all nerves of what part of the body? The mouth, tongue? Mouth. Yeah, exactly. They're all parts. Of the, and that's the way I'm going to have you test these. These are all nerves of the mouth. Right, so this is going to be all dealing with, you know, can the patient sniff? Can they move their tongue around? And then what's that? What's that last one? What do we have them do? Cranial nerve twelve. Tongue movements. Yep. Ah 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 ah. Right. Looking for that uvula. So that's all nerves of the mouth. I forgot to go. Let me step back here with vestibular nerve. One sec. With vestibular cochlear. What would be an abnormal response? hearing yeah like, you do that and they're like i hear it on the right side oops right or they stand up and they're all over the place right they look like they've had one too many on a friday night so down here right you're gonna can you sniff for me okay can you stick your tongue out can you move it up down side to side mm, 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 mm. can you roll it for me no you don't have to make them roll the tongue i was joking about that that's actually a, a genetic trait, believe it or not. If so you can roll your tongue or if you can't. Uh, dominant is you can roll it, non-dominant is you can't. And then 
then can you open your mouth real wide for me and say ah three times ah 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 and you're looking for that uvular lift in the back what else could you do for that one you could poke them in the back of the throat and make them gag i can 100 percent guarantee that you guys are not going to do that on me unless you want to see my technicolor yawn because i have a really strong gag reflex back there it'll make me throw up and you'll get a coffee bath Okay, and then we've got cranial nerve 11. I don't know how to test this one. Shoulder shrugs. Yeah, see, do you see what I did there? I don't know how to test this one, right? Shoulder shrugs. So can you lift your shoulders up to your ears for me? What would be abnormal there? I can't this right where they can't at all right or you see this this is common in a stroke patient you'll tell them lift both shoulders this one will come up and then you'll see this where it's just a delayed response that would be an abnormal response with the mouth anything that's odd right they stick their tongue out and they can't move it they can't say ah um they can't sniff and move that kind of do the wolverine sniff as i like to call it from the x-men <laughs> I think that's the last one, isn't it? Yeah, look, we got a blank one. That blank one doesn't count. There's nothing on that. I'm not going to trick you. Does that make you feel a little bit better about this? Tons better. Yeah, it's not that hard, right? Again, so you're going to come in. I hope I get the blank one. Yeah, that one's gone. I promise you that. You're, like I said, you're going to come in. If you come in, you introduce yourself. Um, you, you know your name. You ask for consent, and oh, I think if I think if you wear your uniform and badge, you get a point for that too. I'm pretty sure. So, like, you could probably get five out of ten and not even do the test. So it's not that difficult. I'll have all the tools. So I'll have the pen light. I'll have um, the reflex hammers. I'll have all that stuff there for you. You don't have to bring anything with you. If you have a stethoscope that you prefer. Like maybe you have your own. Like I have my own. I like my stethoscope. I don't like using loaner stethoscopes. That's a creepy thing. Bring it. It's fine. You're allowed to use your own stethoscope. I'm not going to make you use one of our ones that maybe you're not used to. Because you'll find that once you get your own stethoscope, you get used to listening to your stethoscope, and then you put somebody else, put another one on, and it's weird. It just doesn't seem to be the same. So if you want to bring your own stethoscope and blood pressure cuff, bring your own blood pressure cuff and steth stethoscope. But as you look here, the vitals themselves are only three questions out of like 20, I think is the total number. So don't totally freak out about the vitals. Make sure you know it, but make sure you know all the other stuff. I know I'm mean, you'll learn everything. Any questions? No, you're only gonna pick one. One card. Yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing here just so you can see my pretty face. I'm just joking. Yeah, so you're just going to come in. I'm going to have all the cards there. You'll pull one. Do it. Honestly, most of the time, you'll be done within three to four minutes. Doesn't take that long for most of these, right? I one's probably one of the longest ones because you have like a couple things to do or maybe the tongue, uh, 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 right? For the most part, blood pressure. It's because you'll freak out. That's the only reason it'll take so long. Any questions? Cool. All right. Is this helpful? I have a question real quick. Sure. So you said that um, I haven't completely looked at the calendar yet, but we're taking our test while we also do the skills portion, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we've adjusted the test to know that you're going to be out for a couple minutes. Okay. And that's why I think I, I, I got to check with Dr. Johnson about if you're going to do partners. I think we might have said not to do partners so that you don't lose double time, if that makes sense. Because that way I just pull you, you come back and do it and you're done. Your partner doesn't have to sit there while they do you know, that type of an idea. Okay. I think that's what we did. I just got to double check that we talked about that. My brain right now is not registering that. Okay. So is the, the grading like zero, one, two, or is it hypo, normal, hyper? I, you could do either. 
If you want to do zero, one, two is fine. If you want to do hyper, hypo, normal, that's fine too. I can translate that part of it. I, believe it or not, I've been in physical therapy a little bit. <laughs> uh, I have a question. I'm about to turn in Dr. O'Neill's homework soon. Is okay. anything that a patient says subjective, like about their pain? Anything okay. the patient says is subjective. Even if they tell you, I've got suicidal ideations, that is a subjective statement. Uh, pain, the, so pain is a unique thing. Pain is a, an object or reporting of a subjective feeling. So because it's a subjective feeling, it goes in subjective. Now, some clinics will tell you to put an objective. If the clinic tells you to do that, guess where you put it? Objective. You know, we, we don't overrule clinics, but it is a subjective reporting. If patient says, I don't feel good today, that would be a subjective reporting. I don't like you. That would be a subjective reporting. Everything sound good? And then uh, what time on Thursday are you going to do this again? Uh, same time. Okay. Same bad time, same bad channel. No one asked for an evening one, so I'll do double set today and Thursday. And like I said, I'll post a recording of it. This actually went better than I thought it was going to go. You could do either. So the Mar Mar uh, I had a little stroke there again. Mara asked, can we hit your thumb or hit the tendon? If you can get the tendon, go ahead. Um, I, I have a trouble with that because I like to have my thumb on it so that I can feel the muscle contract. So if you can get the tendon and just hit the tendon with your bicep tendon reflex, go for it. I'm just evidently too like all thumbs and I can't do it. I'm gonna, even if I don't have my thumb there, somehow or other, I'm gonna smack my thumb with the reflex hammers. I might as well do it willingly. Make sense? We're practicing all this again on the 317. I believe so. Yeah, I think that's the day of the lab day. Pretty sure. Yeah, the mock practical. The mock practical. So you have a mock practical where you get the written, mock written part, and then we'll have time to practice. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Or awesome. If there are Thank any, you. any questions, don't feel yeah, don't feel free. Feel free to shoot me a message. I'll be here. Um, but I appreciate you guys stopping in today, and thank you for coming in.